let's get started today. I have your exams. If anyone didn't get exams, you can come up after class to pick them up. And I know many of you did not get to lab last Wednesday, but on the lab on Wednesday, the participation grade was doing a pointer problems, and you all did these in 102. If you do them by Friday, you can still get your participation grade for last Wednesday's lab. So I encourage you to do it. It takes no more than an hour. And let's see, those were the two big announcements I wanted to make. The, what I plan to do today is go over the exam and then we're going to start into what are called linked data structures, which are things like lists, and queues, um, and they do make use of pointers. I will show you briefly how they make use of pointers, but we won't actually get to their implementation until probably early next month. Instead, we're going to initially just look at their API, their application programmer interface, and how we use them. And then later we'll take a look under the hood. And we'll do that with lists, with queues, with uh, something called maps, and uh, sets before we start looking at how they're actually implemented. So unfortunately, Canvas does not have the same features that Blackboard does, and we've not yet figured out other than by just rote counting how to determine the stats for the exam. I do know that the median for the paper version was 60 out of 80, and the median for each of the two pro coding problems was 15 out of 15. Now that just means more than half of the students scored 15 out of 15 on each of the coding questions. I'm not sure what the average is because, again, Canvas isn't good with that. Um, so I don't yet have the stats. I'll try to get them by Thursday. So if you go to exams, you can actually now see the midterm one solutions. I don't have them yet for the coding. I will get those up. We finally got the last person to do it. I'm not only going to go over certain of the problems. I think uh, things like the fill in the blank, you can look at, see for yourself. The So I'm going to start with problem two, which was on separate compilation. And there you were asked to declare a class name ballot. And it was going to be used with a program named vote.cpp. And what this problem was seeking to determine was if you knew how to follow some naming conventions. So the class declarations go in a .h file named after the class, hence ballot.h. And the class method definitions go into a .cpp file named after the class. And then you can compile it using that command. So the two files, vote.cpt and ballot.cpp. Some of you tried to compile the .h file. That's an error. You don't compile .h files. They don't have so-called executable code. They are instead included in .cpp files where they can be compiled. So you got a point taken off if you try to compile a .h file. Do not compile .h files. Okay? They do not contain executable code. They contain variable declarations. Then separate compilation means that you compile the two files separately using the dash c option and then you link them together with their .o files. So the dash c option produces what are called object files or .o files and then you can link those two together 
to create your executable. And if you remember, the .o files contain some information. They contain a unresolved function table because they may be referring to functions that are defined in other files. And they have a function defined table which is the list of functions that they define. And the linker uses these two tables to resolve undefined function references. So specifically, vote.cpp probably has a number of calls to the member functions of ballot, which were unresolved. So in the unresolved function table for ballot.cpp, there are going to be some member functions for ballot. And conversely, in ballot.c, I'm sorry, this is vote.cpp, where that's true. So that is vote.cpp. And then in ballot.cpp, that function defined table has the member functions for ballot. And so when the linker goes and is looking for these member functions for ballot for vote.cpp, it finds them in the function defined table for ballot.cpp. Okay, and then finally, I want you to execute vote from the command line by redirecting standard in from a ballot named ballots.txt and the way you redirect standard in is with the less than operator at the command line and you're also asked to redirect output to a file called results.txt and the way you redirect standard out is with the greater than sign and it actually doesn't matter in which order it appeared you could have put the greater than results.txt first and the less than ballots.txt second. What is important is immediately following the operator needs to be the name of the file for which the redirection is being performed. So questions about that one? Okay. So for the next one, you are asked to hash these keys into the hash table. And there wasn't really any problem with separate chaining. So I'm not going to go over it. Again, you, the, you can look at the answers. The real problem was with quadratic probing. So I'm going to illustrate how that got performed. So let me write the keys. Let's see. Keys, the order in which they're being done is 32, then 49, then 19, 52, 58, and 15. Okay, so initially, the table you see on the right would be empty, and the first key is 32, and since the table size is 11, I'm sorry, is 13, we mod everything by 13 to get where it should go. So 32 mod 13 is going to be equal to 6. And since it's the first key into the table, there's no collision. So it goes there. Then 49 mod 6, or mod 13 rather, is equal, mod 13, is equal to 10. And again, nothing has been put into the table yet, so 49 ends up there. Now we get our first collision, 19 mod 13 is 6. So 19 wants to go there, but it's not possible. So with quadratic probing, the formula that we employ is that the next bucket is going to be equal to whatever that original hash was, plus I squared. So initially I is 1, so that gives us 6 plus 1 squared is 7, 
and 7 is an empty spot, so it goes there. And you are asked down here to list the buckets that you probed, so you probe buckets 6 and 7 for 19. Okay. Now we have 52. 52 mod 13 is 0, and nothing has yet gone into 0, so we end up putting 52 right into here. Then 58 mod 13 is 6, so that's another collision. So it's colliding right here is where it wants to go. And when we try our collision resolution and add 1 squared to it, that's no good. So now we try 6 plus 2 squared, which is equal to 10. Okay, but that's no good because 49 is there. So now we have to try 6 plus 3 squared, which when it's modded, which gives us 15, and when that's modded with 13, we get 2, and therefore 58 ends up at location 2. And if you look at what we looked at, we looked at 6, 7, 10, and 2. So down here for 58, the four buckets we probed were 6, 7, 10, and 2. And finally, we do 15. 15 mod 13 is 2. 58 was just put there. So we look at the next spot, which is going to be 2 plus 1 squared. That's 3. So 15 gets put there. And down in our table here, it was 2 comma 3. So you may wonder why I had the second table for you to fill out. It was so you could get partial credit. The TAs were told to just give you a point if you had the key in the right place. But then we also wanted to make sure you weren't just taking wild guess at where to put the keys. We wanted to see that you actually understood how to put the keys in there. Hence, we had the second table where you needed to show us the sequence of buckets that were actually probed. Okay, and it turned out some of you had answers here that were completely different than your answers up here, which kind of unfortunately indicated you probably weren't sure what was going on. Um, but you still actually would get points if you got the right answer here. You'd just lose them here for not showing the right way. Okay, problem four was a pleasant surprise because in the past many students have done poorly on it, but this time I saw most students getting it. So this was the bit shifting and uh, exclusive or problem. And I'm going to go through how to do it for the first one and let you do it for the second. So we start out and we have H is equal to 41. So the first thing you had to do is know how to represent 41 as base 2. So 41 is equal to 1 times 32. That's a power of 2. There's no 16s in it. There is 1 8 in it. That gives us 40 thus far. There are no 4s in it. There are no twos, and there is a one. So that gives us 32 plus 8 plus 1 is 41. Okay, so in an 8-bit number, we have that the first four bits are right here. That's going to be 0 for 16, 1 for 8, 0 for 4. Whoops, that goes not right. First four are these. So one for eight, zero for four, zero for two, and then one for one. And the second set are over here. So there's a zero for the 16, a one for the 32, and zeros for 64 and 128. So that's your binary representation for 41. 
So that's the first thing you had to do was convert 41 to base 2. So 41 base 2 is what you see there. Now, the first thing you do is you left shift H by 2 bits. So when you left shift this by 2 bits, these 2 bits go into what I call the bit bucket. Okay, and the rest get shifted over. So you end up with, so H left shifted 2 is going to be 1010, zero, zero, these four here, then zero, 01, and what gets, as these two shift out, two new bits get shifted in right there. Okay, so these are the two new bits. So that's H left shifted 2. And then we are going to exclusive or it with whatever is in name of zero. Well, name of zero is V, and I told you that V is hex 56. So again, you're going to have to convert hex 56 to a binary representation. Well, hex 5 is 0, 1, 4, 0, 2s, and a 1. And hex 6 is a 4, a 2, and no 1s. So that's the hex representation. This is 5. This is 6. When we do the bitwise exclusive OR, which is what this operator is, 0 XOR 0 is 0. 0 XOR 1 is 1. 1 XOR 1 is 0. 0 XOR 0 is 0, 1 XOR 0 is 1, 1 XOR 0 1, 0 XOR 1 1, 1 XOR 0 is 1. Now you have to finally convert back to hexadecimal. This is F, this is 2. Okay, I know I went somewhat quickly, but I have a detailed explanation in the answer key. So if you didn't quite follow that, feel free to also ask a question now. Okay, again, I'm not going to go over the next iteration. It's similar, and the notes explain what to do. Okay. On five, you were asked to determine which of these two code fragments is correct and to explain why. And on the test, there was a bug initially because that was a minus one. I, in fact, had ran the code and it, in fact, had worked. It did not cause a seg fault as one might have wished then changed it to two. What I wanted you to recognize, there's an idiom here. And what I wanted to see was whether you got the idiom, which is that when you move elements of a vector, or when you shift, or when you insert an element at the front of a vector, and you shift the elements to the right, you need to start the shift at the back. Otherwise, you will overwrite everything. So code in B was doing that. It was starting the shift at the rear of the vector and moving each item back one spot. So if your initial vector was the one you see here, 3, 6, 10, and 9, the second code shifted 9 over 1 to here. Then because the spot occupied by 9 was free, 
it now shifted 10 into that spot. Now the spot occupied by 10 was free, so it shifted 6 into there. Then it shifted 3 over, and the elements were preserved. Conversely, if you did it with A, things don't go so well. So if you start with 3, 6, 10, 9, and you use A, 3 is shifted to the right and it clobbers 6. Then at the next step, you again shift let 3 right and you clobber 10. And now you shift 3 right again and you clobber 9. And so you just clobbered the entire array and filled it with the first element or previous first element. So this one was looking at do you understand this idiom about shifting? Okay. Now, there was a few that handed this exam in early. I know that I will take a look if you said that B was incorrect because it had a minus 2, but then you, I'm really going to look at what you said about A because, to be honest, if you haven't said something really intelligent about A, you're not going to get any points. You should have realized something was horribly wrong with A, that something was perhaps trivially wrong with B, and someone did ask, hey, there seems to be something haywire here. So I will take a look. I won't promise you'll get points back. Okay, on 6, this was an efficiency one. And it was looking to see that you don't want to be either passing vectors by value or returning entire vectors because that's inefficient. So A was inefficient because it was reading strings into a vector and then it was returning the entire vector. Well, let's say you read 10 million strings. It was the New York phone directory you, when you return, are going to copy 10 million names back to the calling program. That's horribly inefficient. Whereas in B, what you're doing is passing the vector by reference, so you're only passing a pointer to that vector, and you fill it with names, but since the vector you're filling is really the one that's back in main or the calling function, that's fine. You're, once you're done, you're done. You don't have to copy anything. So it was much more efficient to do B because it read the strings and assigned them to the vector and did nothing else. Whereas A, in addition to reading the strings, it also had to copy all of them back with this statement. And there was a slight inefficiency, or though very little, it also had to declare a second vector for the task. Okay, so I expected you for your answer to B to say something about how it was passed by reference so you didn't have to copy the vector. And for why A was inefficient, the fact that you were having to copy this entire vector back to the calling program, which is inefficient. Okay. So you'll probably encounter something like this on the final two because you'll remember that one of the goals of this course is to teach you how to program efficiently. And we will come back to efficient and inefficient ways to program again and again in this course, and you'll be expected on an exam to be able to distinguish efficient from inefficient approaches. <clears throat> Okay, seven, most of you got, not going to say anything about it. Eight, you were asked to use a printf statement to print hours in the format hours, minutes, seconds. We wanted the fields to be two spaces wide, and if minutes or seconds were supposed to be padded with a zero if they were single digits. And the only real problem here is some of you forgot how to pad something with 
zeros, you put a zero in front of the width specifier, and that says to pad the field with that character. This happens with checks too, except sometimes instead of padding with zeros, what have you seen checks pad it with? Dash is one. I guess I'd never seen it with dashes. I usually see it with asterisks. You see something like asterisk, 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 3.61. And the way you get that is asterisk 2D. So whatever you put between before the width specifier is the so-called fill character. By default, it's a blank. But if you put something else there, that becomes the padding. Yes? Mm -hmm. Two characters, right? A pattern part. I see what you're saying. Um, in that case, it's not going to work. It's only a zero and the some other non-numeric. So zero and a non-numeric. So you're right. You couldn't pad it with twos, for example. Not going to work. That's a good question. Okay, so that was that. And then, unfortunately, 9 was hellacious. It was a bit of a bloodbath, and so you're likely to see more character arithmetic on the final. You're also seeing it in Lab 5. So there were two things you had to do in 9. You were asked to convert a lowercase form such as a lowercase b to an uppercase b using character arithmetic. So I know it was back in the midst of time, but you were asked in lab 0 0.5, I believe, to do character arithmetic with the gold. Remember, there would be a character from A to Z, and the value of that gold was equal to the character. So if it was an E, it was 5. If it was an F, it was 6. And the way you were supposed to get that was to subtract whatever your gold element was, subtract the character A, and that gave you the amount of the gold. So that's what you were expected to do here, is first find the distance of the letter from lowercase a. And then once you had that distance, you could add that to uppercase A, and that will give you the uppercase version of the character. So for example, if the lowercase letter were E, then E minus A is going to be equal to, in this case, uh, it's 4. Okay, so B minus A is 1, C minus A 2, D minus A 3. 3, E minus A, 4, and then when you add that to A, you get uppercase E. So all you have to know here is that in the ASCII character codes, lowercase characters are contiguous and uppercase characters are contiguous. And this is something you need to put in your toolbox of tricks, is how to do character arithmetic, because it's a fairly common operation that you need to perform in C and C++. Like I said, there will be a question on the final with character arithmetic because I find it so important and unfortunately enough of you missed it that it's clear it's a little hazy. So questions about this? Does that make sense? Okay. And the important thing is you don't have to know the ASCII character codes when you're doing the arithmetic. I don't know what the ASCII character codes. Whenever I need to know, I look them up. All you need to know is that all lowercase characters are contiguous and all uppercase characters are contiguous, and therefore you can do arithmetic on them to find out the distance between two characters. Okay, now moving on to the coding questions.
Okay, so the first code in question featured a reprise of Moonglow. And I actually had showed you the solution to this problem in class on a PowerPoint slide. Okay, where when I motivate it, I string stream. So just to show you, if you go back and look at the lecture notes. There is something here on string streams. And suppose each line of my input consists of a student's exam scores. Okay, final exam is optional. And solution. Okay, and there it was. So, in fact, I had given you the solution to problem one in class, in the notes. It was there. Okay, so all problem one was, was a problem that I'd already shown you the solution to in class. Okay, hopefully that's why many of you did well, but, um, or just that you knew it. Actually, hopefully you knew it well. So, um, I had not told you in class how to do the printf, so that was a little different. But other than that, you were simply being given a single word for the name and then some arbitrary number of exams, and you had to calculate the score. So for that, Here it is. You need to declare a I string stream object to read each line or to have each line and chop it up into fields. And what we do is we're going to read a line at a time. Then we have to reset our average and num scores to zero each time. Each time we clear our I string stream object right here. Then we stuff the line into it here. Then we read out the name first here, and then our loop where we read the scores one at a time until we've exhausted all the scores, and this is the idiom we use from reading until the end of something, and when it's at the end of it, the greater than greater than operator returns false to indicate it failed. In the meantime, we're adding scores to average, and one to num scores. I guaranteed you there would be at least one score so that you didn't have to check for division by zero. The printf, the one thing, couple things here, the minus sign for left justification. 6.2 is what gets you two decimal digits of precision. And then you had to remember that it's not very good with C++ style strings. You have to extract the C style string using name.c underscore string. Okay. Also, you had to be careful at some point that you force this to be whoop, right here. This had to be floating point division. The way I forced it was d, 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 how did I force it? I declared average to be a double. Okay, there were other ways. You could have declared them both to be ints, and before you ever did it, you could have multiplied average by 1.0 and divide it by num scores. That would have worked. This, however, would have failed if they were both integers. Why would this fail to work? It would return an integer because it would first do this division, and since both of those were ints, it would do integer division and later convert the integer result to a float. So the order in which you do your uh, floating point operations is important. It's not commutative like it is in math. Yes?
Yeah. Um, so the question is, is there an advantage to saying static cast uh, double AVG divided by num scores versus saying double AVG divided by num scores. And supposedly this is the correct way to do it, and no one in practice does it this way, so I would say in practice, no. This way is definitely more succinct, and all old style programmers do it this way. This is the way it is supposed to be done because supposedly there is some um, compile time checking that is done to check to make sure that this is something that is really convertible to a double. If you, for example, if declared this as a string AVG, that's really not convertible to a double. And you would get, using static cast, the compiler is supposed to warn you at compile time that this really isn't a kosher um, conversion. Whereas this one will perform it unconditionally at runtime. All it will do is look at the bits. It will look at the first 32 bits or the first 64 bits of whatever is there and convert them. So you'll get garbage. Okay. Now, the idea behind C and C++ is it's not a warm, fuzzy language like Java. It is a racehorse. It is there because you know what you're doing. So most programmers say, look, use the first way because, by gosh, if I say I want a conversion to a double, I know what I'm doing. Don't give me silly warning messages. Okay. Now, the new, warmer, more cuddly textbook says, please do it the second way because you'll get a warning message. Okay. You can see how I feel about the topic because I'm an older C style programmer. So, bottom line to answer to your question, if you do it the first way, great. <laughs> okay. But in uh, just so you know, it might be some shops will tell you you have to do it the second way. Okay, because that's the so-called more modern way. And perhaps if Adam were here, he might give you a strong exposition on why he thinks it should be done using static cast, because he prefers the more modern ways. So do you have Adam for your lab? Ask him tomorrow in lab, see what he has to say. <laughs> Show it to me. I'll give you, I'll give you the point back. <laughs> Wait, he took a point off for using static cast? Yeah, he said, um, okay, now I know how he feels. So he has the same feelings as me. Absolutely, I'll give you that point back. Because <laughs> technically, you did it right. Okay, technically, you actually are right. <laughs> but he's being old style, just like me, which is kind of surprising, because usually he's more about new style. Okay. Uh, second problem. <laughs> Are you serious? Okay. okay, if you did any kind of casting and had points taken off, come up and I will give you points back, okay? That's pretty funny. He took off even more for the old style, okay. So I guess he is. Uh, at any rate, I will give you points back. Okay. Vote count. So I had a more complicated version of this voting problem originally and decided it was unfair to give it to you. I would have given it to an honor section. So if you've never seen voting preference before, there's a type of election in which you order your candidates according to your preferences. So you give, say, one to your most preferred candidate, two to your most next most preferred, three to your next most preferred. And that way, let's say a good example is this election. Okay, I try not to do politics, but 
I know a lot of people don't like either of the two major party candidates. And so one argument that's being made is that you're throwing away your vote if you vote for either the Libertarian or the Green Party candidate. Now, a way around that problem is what's called the preferred auction system. So you might decide that one of your third party candidates is your preferred candidate. And so you'd give them a one. And then I'm not going to try to be Democrat or Republican. You give your major party candidate a two because you can't stand the other one. Okay? So maybe then you give three and four to the other two. Or maybe you don't even vote for those two to show how little you think of them. Okay? So what happens is they add up all of the votes for number one, which is what you did in this problem. But then if no one gets a majority, they eliminate the person getting the lowest number of votes, which in this case would probably be one of the two third party candidates. Now, your vote would still count, it's just that your vote would now be transferred to your number two, presumably the major party candidate. So now you made your point, you really wanted this person, but since that person couldn't be elected, you get second best, and you haven't thrown away your vote. Okay, so now again, they redo it with the votes retabulated, and if there is a person with a majority, that person now wins. And they keep doing that, eliminating the lowest vote getter and moving that person's votes to your next preferred candidate until they have a majority winner. And if you, for example, don't put anything, your votes discard it once it runs out. Okay, So it's considered in some circles, a better way to perform an election, but it can also give anomalies. And a good example was given, I think, for the Burlington, Vermont election a few years ago, where um, it was generally agreed that a person was elected that no one really wanted. And somehow they managed to get past um, the uh, poll. But it is generally considered better than what is called our first past the poll thing, which is like a horse race, which means whoever has a plurality wins. At any rate, I was going to have you do all of that. That's too complicated for this problem. That would have been a good lab assignment, but not a good exam problem. So all I had you do instead was find out, count, who was the most preferred candidate? Okay, so essentially it was just could you go through a two-dimensional array in each row, find who had the one, and add it to the appropriate vote count. So this one actually tended to have better scores. Okay, so you needed to remember to pass your arguments by reference. Please, please pass vectors by reference, even if you're not changing them. Putting a const here would have been great. You could have declared this one const because you're not modifying it. Then you have the doubly nested loop there that is simply running through each row and finding who's got the one. And when you find it, you increment that candidate's count. And I broke out, this is a little of a pet peeve of mine, which is failing to break out when you're done because it's inefficient to continue to search. You know that there's not going to be another one in that row. So any more comparisons you do are a waste of time. So I would prefer you break out when you're done. And then at the end, I set the winner. And in this case, I'm setting it to the first candidate. And then starting from candidate one, I'm checking to see if any candidate has more votes. And when they do, I update winner and I return winner. And you might ask, why didn't I initialize my candidates to be equal to zero? I could have, but if you look at main, which you're allowed to do, I had already done that. In main, I had resized 
the candidate vector and set it to zero, you're allowed to look on the exam. So, but if you had resized it there and set it equal to zero, that was more than fine. Okay. So questions about that one. Okay, I'll get the solutions posted. Um, yes, one lesson is I do look back through notes to try to find stuff that is similar to what I have done or covered in class. So it really is a good idea to go back over all the notes, make sure that you're familiar with them. Don't always take a problem verbatim from the notes like I did with Moonglow, but um, I will say in the spring I did something similar on the final, or no, I forget whether it's midterm or second midterm. I took something that I knew a lot of people were going to gloss over in the lecture notes, put it on the exam. So what's in the lecture notes is important, and I expect you to read it. Okay. So... Moving on, <clears throat> moving on to today, there was one thing from the pointer notes that we did not look at last time because you didn't need it for the current lab, and that was your ability to sort vectors without having to use insertion sort or selection sort or implement some other sorting algorithm. There actually is a sort method, or not method, a sort function for a vector, and you actually can give it any <coughs> two parts of the vector. Normally you want to sort from the beginning all the way to the end. These things are called iterators, and actually we get to them today. So this says, give me the first object, start from the first, from the beginning of the vector, and sort all the way to the end. And it will sort it in ascending numerical order if it is a num set of numbers, if it's a set of strings, it will sort it in ascending alphabetical order. And you don't always want that. For example, sometimes you might want to sort in descending order. Sometimes you have a more complicated data structure that needs to be sorted, like, say, names that have a first name and a last name. So if you want to do that, you can provide your own function that returns a bool. It takes two arguments, which are two of your elements to be compared, and you perform whatever comparison you're going to do and then return it. As a more complicated example, let's say that we had a class name, and it happens. You have string, first name, string last name, as we all know, we typically, if the last names match, then want it sorted by first name. So in this case, the function would be bool, say name compare. I can choose any name I want, but often using compare helps. So name and one, name and two, and what should I do here? What should I be, there should be something else with these parameters. There's two parameters, that's correct. Reference, I want to pass them by reference. I don't want them getting copied, that would be inefficient. So it would be something like if name one dot say last name equal equal name two dot last name. Actually, let's do it in a more 
Let's do it starting with a less than. So if it's less than, we will return true because n1 is less than n2. Else, if n2 dot l name is less than n1 dot l name, we return false because n1 is not less than n2. In the last case, I don't have to compare them. What's the last case? Have to be. They're equal. So else, you might put a comment, they're equal, but you shouldn't put a comparison because you know they're equal. That would be a waste of time. So else, if n1.name, I'm sorry, first name, less than equal, just arbitrarily, if I'm assuming if the first names also match, that I want to preserve the original order, I return true, else I return false. So if they're absolutely identical, I have to give some answer. And in that case, I normally go for what's called order preserving, which is if name one was first in the original order, it should also be first in the second order. That's called an order preserving sort. Okay, so this was a more complicated example where I first compared last names, and if they were equal, then I compared on first names. And as a third argument to the sort, I can then give a pointer to the function. And I know we haven't really talked about passing functions as an argument, but you can do that. So this is passing a function that sort will use to compare the two. You'll see more about function pointers probably in 302 or 360. We're not going to get into a great exposition here about how they're declared or anything, but you can pass a function as a parameter. You pass it by passing its name. Yes? Is sort actually additional that we use in our I don't want you to use it unless I tell you to. Okay, so I will tell you whether, um, if I want you to do a sort, I'll tell you whether you can use sort or whether you should. It is very efficient. It doesn't use insertion or selection sort. It uses, I believe, an algorithm called quick sort, which is basically the fastest known uh, sorting based on comparison. So certainly, though, feel free to use it when you go out in the real world. And if you have a question if you, about whether it's okay to use it, send us a private <coughs> communication. Piazza will tell you. Okay. So that's just something to put in the back of your minds as something that might be helpful to use at some point. Okay. So you may not realize it, but fall break actually did fall exactly halfway in the semester. And we're moving on now to a few more ways to organize our data. It turns out that lists and double-ended queues, which are what DQs are, aren't a particularly efficient way of ordering information, but they are useful for storing certain types of information, like, say, grocery lists. Okay, grocery lists are something you keep. You dynamically add and remove things from grocery lists. So another example is mail. Sometimes you have your mail items, and they're all kept in a list. Okay, now, generally, they are sorted, so probably you wouldn't be using an actual list data structure. But if it's unordered for some reason, you might. At any rate, we're going to be talking about lists and DQs and also some bad vector usage over the next couple days. The book actually introduces something today which I think is important to talk about for a moment. So in the reading, you were asked to start with 7.11, which is abstract data types. So you're actually 
being introduced to abstract data types now. So a list is an example of what is called an abstract data type. So an abstract data type is a data type that organizes information and provides certain abstract operations on it. So in this case, the list supports things like append to the end of the list, prepend to the beginning of the list, insert after some item in the list, insert before some item in the list, delete some item from the list, find some item in the list. You hopefully read today's assignment and there were some this is the list ADT. There it is. So a whole bunch of operations. Now, this is not an exhaustive list. It's not exactly the list provided by C++ because C++ provides a concrete implementation of the list and specifies the set of operations that it provides on the list. But the idea with an abstract data type is that as an abstract set of operations that you can perform on it and a certain organization in this case the idea is that it's a linked list of some kind with the items pointing to each other so the idea is you have some things like three six ten nine maybe and each element points to the next one using pointers hence the used linked data structures. And we'll get into the way the pointers work in a couple weeks, but that's the idea with a list is that each item points to the next one. And the idea with an abstract data type is that you have a public, so it's called an ADT, and it publishes a public list of methods. or member functions called the application programmer interface. Which is abbreviated API. So I always say API. And then it has a the concrete implementation or concrete realization of an ADT protects its member variables so that you can't see how it actually performs the implementation. In fact, it might be that the list could be implemented as a vector, or as an array, or as a linked list. Turns out that in Python, I believe, their lists are actually implemented as arrays, not as linked lists. So we protect the member variables so that we can easily change the implementation without destroying the rest of the programs that depend on it. For example, someone might come up with a brilliant new list implementation and we'd like to use it. But we don't want to break everyone's code that depends on us. Well, by protecting our member variables, it's easy to swap out the old implementation, put in the new implementation, ship it to everyone, and as long as they relink their code with this new implementation, they're fine. Since they went through the API, which we endeavor not to change, so as much as possible we don't change the API. As long as we don't change the API, we don't break anyone's code. Okay, so the advantage of an abstract data type is that by protecting the member variables, we allow the implementer to change the implementation without breaking the rest of our programs. OK? 
Okay, so that's an important point. And the list and DQs are examples of abstract data types. Okay, so Dr. Plank gives some concrete examples. The book gave you some good abstract examples. And the reason the book did it that way is the book is language agnostic. That book is meant to be used with Java, with C, with C++, with scripting languages. So they didn't provide a specific implementation. They gave you a generic set of operations. Not every language supports all those operations. Okay? If you want to find the operations supported by a particular C++ uh, data type, there is a good reference called, I think, CPP reference. Let me make sure that's the right one. Yep, cppreference.com is a good reference source for finding the API and a description of the API of various C++ data structures. Okay, so if I look up, if I Google cppreference.com and list, comes up, first thing, std colon colon list, and there it is, parameters, member types, which you don't care about, member functions, which you do care about, because it tells you everything you can do with them. Okay, so for example, there's insert, then you could click, and it will go to insert. And I know it looks pretty technical, but it certainly is a place to start, especially when you're trying to figure out what operations might be available. Okay, the lecture notes, of course, provide a more friendly way of the same thing. So Dr. Plank basically gives a number of examples of using lists. So the canonical example with a list is that you want to reverse the elements of the list. So if you read in the numbers 3, 6, 8, 5, you want to print them out in reverse as 5, 8, 6, 3. And of course, you did that already with vectors. You read them all in, you traverse the vector in reverse, works fine. Okay, with lists, you can do it a different way. What you can do is as you read each element, you can prepend. So we read three, and initially our list consists of three. Then we read six, and we prepend six to the list. Then we read eight, and we prepend eight to the list. Then we read five, and we prepend five to the list. And when we're done, the list is already reversed, and we can simply traverse it from front to back. Okay, so here's the code. If you want a list, just like a vector, you say list and the type of element it will be storing. You also need to include the list from the library, just like you include a vector from the library. Now this is something we just touched on a moment ago, which is this is an iterator. So you want to be able to traverse through the elements of your data structure. Now with a vector, how do you do that? How do you traverse through the individual elements? You use indices, an integer. You say for i equals 0, i less than, say, v dot size. I plus plus. Okay, so that works fine with vectors because they use integer indices, but it doesn't work well with arbitrary collections of objects where you basically just want to be able to say start with the first element, then go to the next element, then go to the next element. So iterators let you do that. Basically, they start by pointing to the first element. You can think of them a little bit like a pointer. They start by, they'll generally be directed to point to some element of the collection. 
and then there is a way to advance them to the next element. So in this case, we start, we just read lines, and push front is the prepend command for the C++ list, not prepend, push front. So it pushes an element onto the front of the list. And then you can see here is our loop for iterating through the list. So lines.begin gives us, in effect, a pointer to the first element of the list. Lit++ plus plus advances that pointer to the next element of the list. And then lines.end is actually a pointer to one element beyond the end of the list. So I'll explain that. The way a list can be conceptually thought of is as having what are called two sentinel values on either end. So if this was 5, 8, 6, and 3, conceptually there are two what are called sentinel values sitting on either end. Okay, and the reason for the word sentinel, just like a sentinel stands guard at the entrance, these two stand guard at the beginning and end of the list. So actually, this is the lines.end. So when you lines.end returns a pointer to that thing, lines.begin returns a pointer to the actual first element of the list. So initially, lit points to that first element. Then when you say lit plus plus, lit points to the second element. And just like you dereference pointers using an asterisk, you dereference a iterator to get the value of that list element. So in this case with lit pointing to the first element, we would print 5. Then when it's pointing to 8, it prints 8. So the asterisk dereferences the iterator and it returns the contents of that list element to which it points. Okay, so that's a very simple example. But do first, there are a couple important things here. First of all, the idea of what a list looks like. Okay, it's kind of a linked collection of items. There's a sentinel value at the beginning and a sentinel value at the end. You use this notion of an iterator to traverse the elements of the list. It points to each element of the list in turn. Think of it like a pointer. And each list has some methods the begin member function returns a so-called pointer to the first element of the list. The end member function returns a pointer to the sentinel <coughs> element at the end of the list. It does not return a pointer to the last element of the list. It returns a pointer to the sentinel element at the end of the list. It's a nonsensical value. Okay, so questions about that. Okay, so you can do it another way. You can also reverse. You can go through lists in reverse, just like you can go through a vector in reverse by starting at the last element and counting down. To do that, you declare a reverse iterator. And you use the methods rbegin and rend. So now, I think we had 5, 8, what was the next number? 6? 
probably. And three. So our begin returns a pointer to the last item. And as you might expect, R dot end returns a pointer to the sentinel value at the front of the list. Okay, and this is horrible in my opinion. I think that is horribly confusing, just like Dr. Plank does. I think it should be minus minus, but I didn't design it. And the designer gets final say, so they said it would be plus plus. So in this case, it is actually moving the pointer to the left toward the front of the list. So in this case, I use pushback, just like a vector, to add it to the back of the list. So what I ended actually up with in this case, it wasn't 5863. In this case, if I read if the values were 3685, the actual values on the list would be 3, 6, 8, 5. And when I start iterating in reverse and go to the left, it also prints out 5, 8, 6, 3, thus reversing. Yes? Okay, very good. So the question is, what's the difference between just saying something like lines dot end minus one, right? So first of all, it's not an integer like it was with a vector. This is actually a pointer value. It's a memory address like 0x1000. So subtracting one off of it, these elements, unlike a vector, they're not stored contiguously in memory. They can be stored at different places in memory. That's one of the flexible parts of a list. So you couldn't even be sure that the next element is at minus 1. Okay, So that's one reason. The other is it's because once you've declared it to be a reverse iterator, I'm sorry, once you've declared it to be an iterator, it won't work that way. It won't work properly with end, and you can't say minus minus. It's just the way they set it up. I guess the answer is because they didn't design it that way, so you can't do it that way. What you say makes sense, they just didn't design it to work that way. Okay, any other questions? In that case, we'll pick it up on Thursday. We'll also talk a little bit about lap six on Thursday.